I'm going to talk about Nietzsche today. Uh, the most difficult thing about Nietzsche is to spell his name. And, and what's really difficult is to spell the name of the person who, whom he is reacting to, who defined Nietzsche's entire philosophical career. Uh, and that person is Schopenhauer. Now, Schopenhauer is not easy. It's S-C-H-O-P-E-N-H-A-U-E-R, Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer was, without any question, uh, the greatest pessimist that ever lived. Um, now, now, the reason for his pessimism was uh, substantial and personal. Uh, he was very interested, even when older, he was very interested in 18-year-old girls. And, and for the most part, they said, uh, get away from here. So uh, Schopenhauer felt that the world was not a good place. But he had, he had more reason to think that, uh, many more reasons. One was the essential collapse of religion in the latter part of the 19th, well, even the earlier part of the 19th century. What I mean by the collapse of religion is the inability of a lot of people to take seriously and take literally uh, what was offered to them in the form of Christianity. Uh, Schopenhauer felt that the universe was such a bad place. I mean, if you, if you really just think about, for a minute, think about the food chain. What a nasty thing that is. How awful it is that creatures have to constantly eat each other in order to live. I mean, daily eat each other to live. If you consider that, Schopenhauer said, let me tell you, if there was anyone who created the world, he said, it was the devil. It was the devil. And when you say things like that, you, uh, you realize, if you're, I, I realize that uh, you're, dealing, you're dealing with somebody who really doesn't see the positive side of anything. And that's Schopenhauer. Does not see the positive side. But he does see with great clarity everything that's bad about the world. Uh, you know the, uh, you, you've seen the uh, uh, bumper stickers. The bumper sticker, that one particular one that says, shit happens and then you die. <laughs> that's Schopenhauer's philosophy. <laughs> Uh, he, he is of the opinion, he is of the opinion that uh, everything that we do is in the end meaningless. Because all of life, he says, is a, an oscillation, a movement from the pain of desire to the boredom of satisfaction. <laughs> huh? Now think about this for a minute. Uh, you're, 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 you're in constant pain because you want this, that, and the other thing. I, I, had, uh, I had occasion to see a few minutes of QVC the other day. Uh, you know, this, this, this place where they plug the garbage that uh, somebody made the mistake of manufacturing. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, it's unbelievable the desire that people have. You know, they uh, 10,000 something. I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. People call up and say, I've got to get one. You, 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 you know what I'm talking about, is it QVC? I think it's, it's, that's what it is. Well, Schopenhauer says it's a constant pain. We, we're, we're, we're constantly in the business of <laughs> catering to ourselves. And catering to yourself is, a, is, a, is big business and painful business because if you can't get satisfaction immediately, then immediate satisfaction would maybe satisfy, would really feel good. But if you can't get it right away, it's painful. When you do get it, it's over. It's the notion of it's all over. It's, it's, it's all over Schopenhauer. It's, it's all over. It's no point. There's no meaning to life. Yeah. And in the end, you die. And you look back on it. You know, if, you, if there were a St. Peter and he gave you a chance to look back on it, you'd look back on it saying, what a shame. What a worthless existence. He says that human life actually looked at from the outside is humorous, is a joke. Looked at from the inside is a tragedy. It's a tragedy because in the end we go away with high desires and very little to show for it. That's Schopenhauer. And this view is sometimes called nihilism. 
from the Latin word Nile, N-I-H-I-L, nihil. And nihilism is, is essentially just a very simple view. It's the view that nothing has any meaning, nothing has any value, right? Life isn't worth living. Not an uplifting proposition. Now, the interesting thing about Schopenhauer was, of course, that he didn't mind living to a ripe old age. And toward the end of his life, he became very popular. People came to him from long distance and say, Schopenhauer, tell us how bad life is. <laughs> and, and he did with great satisfaction. So, <laughs> so, there, so there, you know, there, there's, it's difficult to live your philosophy sometimes. <laughs> Nietzsche f sees this, and this is what sets the problem for him. He, he is very serious in, in saying that life does not have any meaning that you can find. But he also says that life has a meaning that you can create. And that is the ground tone of Nietzsche's philosophy. That meaning in life is not something we find. Meaning in life is something we create. And the question is, how do you create meaning in your life? Uh, there is an absolutely marvelous essay by Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, which I did not put down on the list, but let me recommend it now. The essay is called Self-Reliance. Uh, many of you have read it. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a, it's a manifesto on behalf of American ways. But Emerson was carefully read by Nietzsche. And Nietzsche converts this into what you might call a European version, but I think in some ways not a European, but a universal version of how to f create some meaning in your life. Well, how do you do it? Number one, you gotta ask yourself, not who am I? Because that suggests that you already are somebody. You gotta ask yourself, who do I wanna be? What kind of life do I wanna live? What kind of personality do I want to have? And then you go ahead and create it for yourself. Now, that sounds so easy, but, you know, we're in the business of creating ourselves all the time. You know, yeah. What I mean by that is, how many times do you find yourself, uh, at least I find myself, getting furious about something, getting mad, and then I catch myself and say, now, is that the way you want to be? Is this the kind of person you are? And sometimes I say, yeah. And, somet <laughs> and, and sometimes I say, no, that's, that's, that's not how it is. That's, that's not it. That's not it. I, I better do something about it. So number one, you examine yourself. But number two, you look at the world and you look at your life and you find that there is energy behind all of this. And it's the energy that matters. And you realize that without the energy, life is not worth anything. But with the energy, Life is wonderful. Uh, I remember an instance of uh, being very sick in graduate school. I caught some kind of a bug and uh, really hurt. I mean, I had difficulty getting out of bed to go to the bathroom. Uh, everybody had been in situations like this. Uh, and, and then, little by little, the body fought back. And uh, I found myself getting up, and I went to one of these little diners. Back then, you know, 100 years ago, there were these wonderful shiny diners that you could go to. Uh, and uh, went there, and I had a plate of pork chops. <laughs> and never has food tasted like that. It was so incredibly marvelous. It was so deeply meaningful, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you say, pork chop? Yeah, pork chop. Yeah, I still love pork chops just for that one experience. You know, you know what I mean? Because the energy comes back. And, and, you, and you, you're almost bursting with that energy and say, yeah, bring it on. Yes. Now, Nietzsche has this wonderful German word that doesn't really sound very good in English. The German word is bejaung, bejaung. Ja means yes. Bejaung means to affirm or to say yes to. But there's not, not, not a good English word for that, not a good American word. The yes saying, you know, to be able to say yes, yes to something. Yes, this is good. Exactly the same as what God is supposed to have said after he created each day something, something important, and then he looked at it and he said, yay. Right? He affirmed it. He said, good. 
That's the way it should be. That's exactly what we need to do, says Nietzsche. That's exactly what we need to do. If we've got the energy to do it, if we find that the world really is as good, actually better than we ever suspected. The world is a magnificent place. Uh, we just put out uh, a new bird feeder. And you can't imagine the energy with which those birds are doing what they're doing. You can't, I mean, you can imagine it because you must have done it yourself. But they're flitting back and forth. I tell you, they, they use as much energy in flying there and getting that one little seed as, as, as they get out of the seed. <laughs> but, but it doesn't really matter. It's, it's uh, you know, it's like that. Now, Schopenhauer is of the opinion that life comes to an end, and when it ends, that's it. And that kind of sadness is what Nietzsche wants to reject. Uh, th there is a, a wonderful poem that I like to think of uh, when, uh, when I think of Schopenhauer. Yeah. It's a, a poem that goes like something like, we thank with brief thanksgiving, whatever gods may be, whatever gods may be, that no life lives forever, that dead men rise up never, that even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. You say, oh my God, I mean, this is a terrible view. Uh, and Nietzsche says, don't go there. But don't go there. Don't go there, but, but don't go and get the idea that you live forever either. So he wants to negotiate in some fashion between the traditional religious view that there's another home for us on the one hand, and on the other hand, the view that there is no home for us, and everything is lost, and life is miserable, and what the hell are we doing here anyway? Somehow, in between the two is where he wants to come out. And the fundamental notion here that I've already indicated to you is that of energy. Energy, life force, affirmation of life, that's what it's all about. Okay, now, Nietzsche finds that there's a fundamental distinction a fundamental distinction among human beings, a distinction that goes on the basis of how much energy we have. And this is, by the way, uh, sometimes called energy of will. And he, he likes the word will. It's, it's very much in the tradition of German philosophy to talk about will, which is uh, forceful exertion, right? Uh, the application of energy, that's will. And he says, uh, it's all a question of how you direct your will, how much energy you manage to get. And no one can explain why, simple, why some, some people are energetic and full of life, and some other people, you know, you, you can't get them going. Uh, I, I'll tell you the story of a student of mine. Uh, he uh, came to my ethics class, and within a matter of a couple of weeks, sitting in the front row, I saw a kind of, you know, hangdog look about him, uh, as though everything is lost. So I went and asked him what's going on. He said, well, I don't think I understand any of these lectures that you give. I said, would you like to come and talk to me, and I'll see if I can really dumb it down for you? I didn't put it that way. <laughs> uh, I'd be glad to talk to you and, and go over it slowly. And he said, no, no, I wouldn't understand it anyway. <laughs> I said, well, have you thought? He said, and I can't listen moreover, he said, because if I listen, I can't write. But if I write, I can't listen. <laughs> so, OK, all right. He said, how about getting some notes from some of your uh, uh, classmates? Uh, then you could just listen and get the notes from somebody else. Not a bad idea. He said, it's, it's no use. They wouldn't give them to me. I said, okay. Well, have you tried to call, call them? No. He says, I, I don't know their number. <laughs> have you tried looking up the number? No, they wouldn't be home anyway. <laughs> now, now, the astonishing thing about this guy is uh, that he ever made it into Vanderbilt, number one. I think he must have come under somebody else's name. Uh, that he ever made it in, number one, and that he ever got up for breakfast. <laughs> because, you know, breakfast may have been poisoned. Uh, who knows what kind of bad thing would, would, would befall him. 
Absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah, you sometimes have the feeling it's like, you know what like a, a wet mob is like? A wet mop? <laughs> you know, you, you try to get a wet mop to stand up, you know, like this. <laughs> over. Well, that's the guy. All right. After a while, you want to say, look, I think I'm going to kill this man. I, I can't stand, you know, I can't stand the idea of somebody who's beaten without he starts the fight. I can't stand that. That's not the end of the story. Somehow he managed to graduate out of Vanderbilt. God knows how. And I get a telephone call from him. Oh, probably five, eight years ago. Something like that. And he is a computer specialist in Dallas. And he talks like a different human being. And he says, oh, well, I, I married this wonderful woman and I've got two children and I just want you to, wanted you to know that everything is all right. <laughs> wow, he's right. Everything is, my God, he assures me that everything is all right. I always wanted to get that assurance. <laughs> so what happened? Well, maybe a good woman happened in his life. Maybe the kids sharpened him up. Maybe one day he woke up in the morning, as William James did, and remember that? William James said, hey, I'm just not going to be depressed. I'm out of here. I'm working. Maybe. But the point is, whether you have will or not is one of those ultimate inexplicable facts about you. It doesn't mean you can't change it. You could change it, maybe. But... You find yourself in a certain way. Either you're energetic and you go like the Dickens, or you're wilted. Wilted, I think that's a good way to put it. The people who are energetic, Nietzsche calls the strong. The people who are wilted, he calls the weak. And the weak and the strong, he says, have altogether different value systems. And that's really where Nietzsche comes down hard. The value system of the weak, he calls it the herd, because everybody imitates everybody else. You, know? uh, you go to a restaurant and you, find, you say, uh, well, uh, how is the swordfish today? And the waiter says, we sell a lot of it. <laughs> I want to kill him. You know? I wasn't interested in your sales. I was interested in the quality of what you're selling. Uh-uh, no, we sell a lot. So if we sell a lot, that's another way of saying you could have one too because you run with the crowd. We, uh, uh, we had a chancellor here, I won't mention who it was, uh, Wyatt. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and his opinion was that Vanderbilt needs to run with the 16 to 20 best universities and always find out what they're doing, then we do it too, right? And if you say to him, look, you're never going to get anywhere on that basis because you're, you're, you're just doing what these guys have abandoned doing two years ago and now you catch on, right? Can't do it that way. You've got to think for yourself, man. That was tough for him. So uh, what you find is... <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what, you find, what you find is that uh, there is a tremendous amount of energy that the strong have and a total energyless wiltedness among the weak. And the values of the weak are values of togetherness, of uh, everybody's doing it. If everybody's doing it, I'm safe doing it. Everybody, I want to look like other people. We don't like people who don't look, look like us. I don't mean they got two heads, but they might be too short, or they might be a little darker, or they might, you know, be bald for all you know, right? Uh, and, uh, Got to look. <laughs> okay. <Don't> go <laughs> so, so, so what happens is, what happens is that, that the fundamental value of the weak is um, their weakness. It's, it's, um, it's their togetherness. It's the fact that they don't want, nobody should rock the boat. Nobody should be different. Nobody should believe otherwise than what everybody believes. So, so we're all in the business of marching together into oblivion. An even stronger value of the weak, an even stronger value of the weak is the opposite of this, what they call goodness. Goodness is this milk toast mentality. And, and that, the, the opposite of that is evil. 
anybody who's different from us is evil. Anybody who's different from us, you know, in significant ways, uh, and I've made fun of it by saying bald and so on, but, you know, b different from us in the sense that maybe they are of a different religion that requires having a large beard or suggests that it might be uh, important to have a large beard. Uh, or that they're people who uh, don't believe in, well, I, I, look, I'll give you an example. I, a friend of ours was a uh, uh, young guy, uh, uh, decided to rent an apartment, move out on his own from his parents' place, and uh, he never ate in and he never cooked. And it was one of these places where you put in the large apartment building, you put your garbage outside and you were supposed to put it carefully in a wrapper and tie it with string. I'm not justifying it. I'm just telling you that's how it is. And he never put anything out. The neighbors came to visit him after a couple of months. <laughs> they said, uh, do you eat? He said, yeah. Uh, there's never any leftovers out there. Well, he said, you, if you're interested in my leftovers, I'll be glad to give them to you. <laughs> no, no, they were interested in why he was so different that he didn't have garbage like the rest of us have garbage. And I think that's sickening, yeah. right? I think, but, but Nietzsche says that's how the weak operate because they don't know where trouble is coming from. And the weak have to protect themselves. Okay, let me put it this way. Nietzsche is of the opinion that the fundamental problem of weak people is resentment. And that arises directly, he says, out of their, directly out of their own Weakness. Here's the way it goes. If I am weak, I feel vulnerable. Right? I feel vulnerable. Anybody could hurt me. Charlie could hurt me. You could hurt me. You say something nasty. Oh, really bad. Right? Anybody. Well, if, for instance, your wife or your husband is in a position where they could hurt you, uh, by, for instance, what they do you're going to be of the opinion that it's important to possess them, to control them. So you become possessive and you try to control them. Uh, don't say that to me. I don't want you to be saying anything like that to anybody. So vulnerability leads to possessiveness. Possessiveness, on the other hand, leads to a kind of uh, anger and nastiness because it's difficult to possess another human being. You know, they always wiggle out. They don't like for anybody to tell them, do this and do that. So possessiveness leads to this great sense of, of anger. But on the other hand, you see, the anger can only be satisfied if you could really strike out and hurt somebody. I really hate people who do that. You know, you, you, you know that phrase, I just hate that person. Well, if you hate somebody and you find yourself that you're so weak and you're so worried about things that you can't really hurt them, then what comes out of that is not just resentment at your own impotence, but also the fear that something bad will happen to you, and worse than that, a tremendous sense of frustration. You're all bottled up. You're all messed up on the inside because you really want to hurt somebody, you really want to own somebody, you really want to control somebody, but you can't do it. You with me? Yeah. Does this sound like anything that ever happens to your neighbors but not you? <laughs> Believe me, it's a tough, tough situation because, because human beings in their weakness get very nasty. The fundamental idea, Nietzsche says, is resentment. Resentment is the sense that you do something to me that I can't reciprocate with. It brings on so much emotion in me that I'd like to do you harm. I can't do it because I'd be in trouble with the authorities. Okay, so if you take this attitude, Nietzsche says, your entire life ends up so bottled up your, your values get so messed up, uh, your, the natural way in which you would act is so inhibited that there's no room for spontaneity, that there's no room for anything that's worth doing. 
spontaneity. Nietzsche is a great believer in spontaneity. So is Emerson, by the way, in self-reliance. And spontaneity means doing something that you didn't expect to do, so doing something that is totally surprising to yourself. Right? Because you're ready to do it, and why not do it now? Right? I'll tell you a story about that. Uh, I've got this student who says, you know, my life is totally constricted. I go from the paper that's due on Monday to the exam I'm taking on Tuesday to what is expected of me in my volunteering work on Wednesday and so on, and I don't have any time for myself. I don't know what to do with myself. And I said, have you thought of doing something spontaneously? He says, what does that mean? <laughs> now, we beat spontaneity out of our kids early in life. Believe me, we do. Don't do anything sudden. Don't do anything that you haven't cleared with us. Don't do anything that might be dangerous. Just don't do. You, you know the, 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 the mother who says, look, uh, look, son, can't see the kids, and say, kids, whatever you're doing, stop it. <laughs> well, that's, that's, the way, that's, that's the way that we tend to be. Um, and it's not a good way to be. It's not a good way to be because we, we're, we're bottled up, as I said. Uh, resentment is powerful. And we can't make any headway in celebrating life, in enjoying the energy that life involves. By comparison with the good and evil value structure of the weak, the value structure of the strong is that of good and bad, not good and evil. Evil is something for the weak that should be extirpated, that should be killed off. Evil is something that is threatening and therefore you've got to get rid of it. Good and bad, on the other hand, the same word good is used in both, but it doesn't mean the same. Good and evil and good and bad, the word good, it does not mean the same in the two. Bad is not anything that you want destroyed if you're strong. Bad is something you overlook. You know, there's, there's so much craziness in the world that you overlook if you're smart. Huh? Your neighbors are crazy. Anyway, if they're not crazy, I don't know, you're so lucky. Uh, but they do things so differently. Right? They scream at each other. Right? They carry on like, like nuts. They buy insane cars. Uh, they, they, they do things, you know, they, 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 they just, they're different. So what do you do if you're strong? Don't notice it. Don't, don't just, who wants that? Nietzsche has this marvelous phrase. He says, look, a um, lot of people think that it's important to forgive. A strong person never forgives. Why? Well, because by the time he'd get around to forgiving, he forgot. <laughs> Forgetfulness is a sign of great strength. Now, if somebody hurts you, how long do you remember it? I know people who remember it from their fifth year. They're five years old, and they're still moaning at 65 of what that boy did to me when I was five years old. Right? And then we say, well, can't you forgive him? And then the person says, yes, but I'll never forget it. Well, the right attitude is, is to say, I may not forgive him, but the only reason I don't forgive him is because I forgot it long ago. That meant nothing to me. That's good. Right? That's good. Good is the strength of being able to forget. Boy, wouldn't it be nice for us to be able to forget. There's so many things that we remember. Some good, but I'm willing to give up all the good memories to get rid of all the bad ones. I'd, I'd be willing to do that. Now, I'm not recommending Alzheimer's. <laughs> because that's... Uh, yeah, but but I, I am recommending overlooking, overlooking the nastiness and craziness and madness and silliness in the world. Okay, so what are, what, what are good and bad, those two? Okay, good for the strong means enjoying the energy of life, doing what you feel like doing. Bad means forgetting about the things that don't agree with you. Forget, forgetting about there's some people who are really not worth spending time with. You, you ever, have you ever felt that? Right? Somebody who really wants to hold on to you, hold on to you, hold on to you, 
And really, the best thing you can do, not to hurt their feelings, is to say, I'm sick. What you're sick of is their company. <laughs> you, you, if you don't know what I mean, I'll give you terrible examples. Uh, so, so spontaneity is good. And I come back to the rest of my story about spontaneity to the kid who felt so imprisoned. Right? And the rest of the stories, I said, look, why don't you today go to the airport? He got plenty of money, the boy. Why don't you go to the airport and catch the next flight? I said, where do I go? He says to me. I said, I don't know where the hell you go. Catch the next flight, wherever it goes. Well, that was, that was shocking to him. Catch the next flight. I said, okay, you might mind if I take my girlfriend with me? I said, be my guest. <laughs> I swear to you, they go to the airport and they take the next flight, the two of them. And the next flight happens to go to New York. And it happens to be a Friday and it's a weekend. And they spend the weekend in New York. And now you think, oh, they checked into a hotel and hoo hoo. No, it's no hoo hoo. <laughs> they never checked into a hotel. They hung out on the street. When they wanted to sleep, they went to Grand Central Station, along with all the homeless people. And he said it was the most exhilarating single experience of his life. He's an attorney now, and he, it's, it's rough, he says. But he remembers that. He remembers that one moment when he did what he wanted to do. You see what I mean? He just up and left. Right? I think that's marvelous. Now you say, look, you can't live your life like that. Of course you can't live your life like that. Because you got a job, you got family expectations and so on, but occasionally can't you just say, hey, I'm going to go to the airport or I'm going to get in my car. I've seen that. I'm going to get in my car and go. Where the hell are you going to go? I don't know. Go. Just go. Spontaneity is that way. Now, how do we act by comparison with that uh, in relation to... Uh, uh, some of my colleagues, uh, a dean, a really marvelous dean that we had at one point, and his wife got restless because he was dean for many years and never had any free time with her. In fact, at one point, she said, you know, he has been dean over 15 years, and he's never filled the gas tank of his car. And he's never asked, how come I still have gas? <laughs> Never asked. She said, let's do something, just up and do it. It's a true story. And he said, OK, no problem. He went to the office, and he called his secretary. This is September. And he said, book a spontaneous getaway for my wife and me in April. <laughs> that's, that's how we deal with spontaneity. You know, that's, uh, that's carefully planned spontaneity. All right, so. Uh, Nietzsche says that the strong and the weak never see eye to eye. Their values are different. Their lives are different. Uh, does that mean that we, uh, that we strong? We're all strong, right? That we strong somehow ought to wage war on the weak? Not at all. What it suggests is that we strong overlook the weak. Don't spend time with them. Get on with your life, right? That's the best thing to do. It's the best revenge. It's just to go ahead and do it. And that's what Nietzsche suggests. Now, how does one go about doing that, and what's the point of it? We've got to recraft our understanding of what it means to live well. That's Nietzsche's view. To live well is not to live long, and certainly not to live endlessly. Now, we think that unless life is such that it's everlasting, if life is not everlasting, life is no good. Nietzsche says, total misunderstanding. There is a tremendous difference, he says, between a life everlasting and a life eternal. Very different. A life everlasting is one where you never cease being who you are. You're, you're going you're gonna, to, you know, if you, if you die here, why you or important parts of you will continue. Maybe your memories, maybe your desires, maybe 
who you are, your character, continues on and will live on through the ages. You'll never die. That's life everlasting. That's not life eternal. And by the way, the church has really messed this up. Uh, li life eternal is the incredible joy of being alive at this moment. It is the joy of the energy of the present. So, you know, I put it this way. Uh, one view, the everlasting life, is extended through time. Uh, the eternal life opens like this, to the heavens. Right? And to the heavens might mean, if you, if you prefer to believe in God, that's fine. Uh, says Nietzsche, it's okay. But that's not the issue. The issue is that there is a, an, a divine joy right? in, in the beauty of the moment. A divine joy in the energy that you feel when you are alive. That divine joy that I felt with the pork chops. That, right? And you say, what an incredibly inadequate uh, source of joy. I mean, couldn't you at least have a steak? Uh, not a pork chop. No, 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 no. That's not, that you're missing the point. All of these moments of eternal joy are very, uh, have their sources in very humble beginnings. Uh, you see the flowers in the morning uh, and on a, on a beautiful spring morning. Uh, you see the rain when you need the rain, and you go out in the rain. I went out in the rain this morning, and within a matter of a minute or two, I was soaked. I, ch I changed shirts. I changed undershirts. Every minute of it, utterly joyous. Utterly joyous, you know? That's eternal life. Doesn't last long. Doesn't matter how long it lasts. Right? If it lasts a minute, if it lasts a half a minute, it is fulfillment. There's nothing more that you need, nothing more that you get, nothing more that you even should seek out. Nothing more. Just that moment. So when Nietzsche is played off by some people to be an irreligious and, and, and nasty man, uh, I think that's wrong. They got the wrong guy. He is a deep religious man, even though he, re he renounces Christianity. He says, I have nothing to do with the churches, remember Kierkegaard? Nothing to do with the churches. I want to be rid of that. I'm not interested. But what he is interested in is the fundamental experience that this is a good day because the Lord made it. That, that you know? And not only that, but the Lord made the day, and we're going to fill, fill it with all kinds of things that will be satisfying to us, and it will be a wonderful thing. So it's the wonder of existence that he's talking about. What is the meaning of life? Here's what the meaning of life is not. How, how about that? You know, I have the audacity to tell you what the meaning of life is. That's crazy. But according to Nietzsche, the meaning of life, I'd be careful. According to Nietzsche, the meaning of life is not the following. One, it is not to go ahead and live as long as you can, and then when you die, you've got to be paid. Right? That's not what it is. Two, the meaning of life is not putting things off, putting things off, putting things off until you retire. And then at last, hey, we're going to have a ball. Okay, that's not the meaning of life. The meaning of life, moreover, is not what many of us in unpleasant jobs, thank God I don't have an unpleasant job, but many of us in unpleasant jobs do or, or feel, and that is, uh, hey, I have, I have, got to manage to stick it out until Friday. Friday, 5 o'clock is heaven. And prior to that, every evening is heaven because I don't have to go back until the morning. And prior to that, the lunch hour is wonderful. And prior to that, the 10 o'clock break, for me, that's great. Yeah? This is a constant extension of life. It's, it's an extension of life where you do not have the ability to enjoy anything because you're always waiting for the future. So what is the meaning of life? Do you know what the meaning of life is? I'll, sh I'll demonstrate it to you. <laughs> it's not as hot as I like, but boy, it's good. It's good. You know, okay? 
God look at, looked at what he created and he said, good. He didn't say, well, mediocre, right? It's good. It's the affirmation of the goodness of all things, right? Nietzsche says there are enemies of life in the world. The enemies of life are the people who want to deny us the delight of living. People who say, you can't enjoy that. Yeah, we used to do that with sex. I know. We, we, we all grew up, I mean, all, all of us grew up with saying, don't do this and don't do that, you know, you're going to get pregnant. It's fun to say that to a guy. Uh, and, 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 and sex is one of the great joys of life, and it's okay, you know. It's not, uh, I mean, you don't, you don't do it with everybody who walks down the stream. Uh, you, 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 you're selective, but, you know, you're selective in what you eat. You're selective in all kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with eating also, you know. Eating should be a, a ceremony. It's not a McDonald's deal where you sit down and you wolf down that, that hamburger and you say, ah, okay, I'm full now, so I'm all right for a few hours. Uh, it's not that. It's, it's a ceremony. It's a celebration. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a delight beyond delights, right? That's eating is. Feeling your skin, now, you know, I don't want to get too personal, but feeling your skin, I don't mean feeling it this way, but feeling from inside what your skin feels like on the outside. You with me? That's nice. That's nice. And you don't know how good it feels until you've got a wound there and it rubs. <laughs> right? then, then, then you know what, how good it would be if you only didn't have that. So, so Nietzsche is, is, is deeply in love with the concrete, right? with, 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 with what we do and what we can do and what, what, if we were sensible, we did do and would do. And that, of course, puts him, uh, he thinks, and a lot of people think, at war with religion. So let me talk about Nietzsche and religion. You remember in the 60s there was a, um, a movement, and that movement was largely centered in, at Emory University in Atlanta called the Death of God Theology, all right? And the Death of God Theology, Altizer, Tom Altizer was the uh, sort of the grand priest of this, and uh, uh, here's the idea behind the Death of God. Um, human beings need to look to themselves for meaning in life, to create meaning in life. You know, God doesn't create meaning for you, so uh, the death of God is the voluntary relinquishment of existence by God in the person of Jesus Christ. And the reason behind it, and you'll think this is sacrilegious, but the reason behind it, so these theologians said, the reason behind it is that human beings have to at last achieve independence. We've got to grow up, folks. And if God says, I sacrifice myself, I'm no longer here for you, I'm gone, then you got to have to rely on yourself, self-reliance, right? You no longer have God to bail you out. Well, it so happens that God doesn't always bail you out either if you believe, even if you believe that he doesn't. Right? So Altizer says, There's, God is dead, right? He gave up his life for us, so that we may take charge of our own lives. Well, that's Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche is not the first one to say God is dead. Sometimes he's charged with that. Hey, he said God is dead. Well, he's not the first one. Hegel said that God was dead. Uh, and Nietzsche just picks that up. And, he, and he, what he means by God is dead is that uh, we really don't need to pay attention to God. We need to pay attention to ourselves. But of course, that is the whole point of turning a kind of dry theology into a personal quest for faith. A personal quest for faith is not one that focuses upon a God of this description or God that God of that description. It's an internal struggle, remember Kierkegaard. It's an internal struggle. It's the internal struggle of finding some, sorry, creating some meaning in life for yourself. And if you want to relate that to the example of Jesus, by all means, do that. Here's what Nietzsche said. The last Christian died on the cross. 
the last Christian died on the cross. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that if we want to be Christians, we want to be like that, right? So that he doesn't end up being the last one. We've got to be like that. And that means, in turn, that you take your cross and carry it. And don't, don't, don't try to go for a life in which everything works out fine. Where the hell does that come from? That's a desire of animals. That's not a desire of spiritual beings. Spiritual beings struggle. Spiritual beings take on the world. Spiritual beings are beings who simply are dissatisfied with their own performance. Instead of saying, hey, I no longer believe in God because, you know, I've got this cancer, or I no longer believe in God, or I'm no longer a religious person, or I'm no longer a spiritual person because I lost money in the stock market. All right? I want to be sure that we're on the same page. Um, these are harsh words, but I really think that instead of being an irreligious man, Nietzsche is a profoundly religious person. But he understands that religion is not easy. Religion is not a religion of consolation. And that's what many of us look to religion for. It's a religion of consolation, meaning everything is going to be okay. God's looking out for you. And then it's... Uh, then you know, then you find that you die. And in the meantime, you suffer terribly. And you say, you cry out to God, why are you doing this to me? And of course, the easy answer is, you don't know why he's doing it to you because he's God and you're not. Okay, that's fair enough. But, but then why is it that we can't say, hey, if I can't deal with it, no one can help me deal with it. Sure, it's wonderful to have somebody, neighbors, your wife, your husband, your children saying, go on and do it. That, that bit of encouragement is great. But that encouragement means nothing if you are not a strong person. Strong person says, yes, I will handle it. Yes, I will I, I face up to the fact that I die. Doesn't matter. Before I die, I will see the sky. And that will be meaningful eternally. Even though, in an everlasting sense, I won't be here, folks. So Nietzsche is not harsh, but tough. Because what he, what he, what he recommends to us is that, uh, that we face up to reality. And that reality is not one that necessarily favors human beings. And that reality is not necessarily something that we can make much of beyond whatever strength we have to have that eternal moment in our lives. Yes, ma'am. Would you define the word religion? Would I define the word religion? Um, well, you know, as, as the word socialism and Christianity and all these big words, it has many meanings. But religion could be an institutionalized form of worship. That's religion. But that's not the religion Nietzsche is talking about. All right? Religion can also mean a set of beliefs that are private but powerful in your life. And I like to talk about that when I talk about Nietzsche. It's your private beliefs that are yours and nobody else's perhaps. And it doesn't matter who else's. But they're yours and they structure your life. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Uh, is, how does he bring in the, the, the eternal returns? Is that a, like a daily, uh, one day at a time, eternity, uh, Groundhog Day repeated? Or <laughs> uh, you're ta the, the question is, how about the eternal return? Now, this is a view of Nietzsche's that, had, that much misunderstanding surrounds. Uh, the eternal return, here, here, here is what Nietzsche says, actually says. He says that um, the same thing happens again and again and again. But I mean not the same thing in the sense that uh, every morning I have breakfast, but the very identical same thing. So, the very identical same thing, notice I did that a second time. Yeah, very identical same thing. Imagine that identically the same happening an infinite number of times. Okay? 
Now, here is the misunderstanding of what he says. The misunderstanding is, and I, if you read this in books, I can show you where. These are books written by idiots. Uh, as though Nietzsche were ever interested in how many times something happens. You know, if it, if it happens a lot of times, it must be good. That's not what he's talking about. So he, here, here's the interpretation that's mistaken. Uh, there's a certain amount of matter in the universe. Okay, only a certain amount, finite amount. There's infinite time. So in infinite time, the same thing, the matter will fall into the same configurations again and again and again. All right? Look, uh, if there's an infinite amount of time for matter to organize itself in a many, many different ways, so the argument goes, then this will happen again sooner or later. And you'll all be here when it happens. All right? And not only will it happen again, it'll happen again and again. And it'll happen an infinite number of times because there's infinite time. You understand? Uh, it's a little bit like uh, the notion, I imagine that you give a computer to a monkey. Right? The monkey doesn't know anything, but he is a typist. So it goes like this, randomly. If you keep on doing this, he keeps, if he keeps on doing this, and they ca calculated it, at a certain reasonable monkey rate, right? He does that for 672,000 years. He will have typed out Hamlet. 672,000 years he types out Hamlet. All right, now, 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 let's think about this for a second. Think about this. He, type, he types it out. And what's wild is that he, the, you know, the last word he misspells. So it's another 672,000 years, but he gets it right. But that time is endless. So I just, you know, just keep on doing. Well, that's what matter does. And so this talk to you by me has already happened an infinite number of times and will happen an infinite number of times again. Garbage. <laughs> if that were the case, I would commit suicide now. The only trouble, the only trouble is, I mean, you know what I mean? doing this that many times? The only trouble is I'd, I'd then be committing suicide an infinite number of times. <laughs> That's too many. Uh, yes, ma'am. What about the statement that we should ignore the weak? That what about the statement that we should ignore the weak? I think it's a good plan. <laughs> well, I mean, look, it doesn't mean you don't help the weak, but don't let the weak annoy you. Don't let them get on the inside of you, right? Uh, yes, pe people, uh, you know, somebody has the same clothes on that you have to an important party, right? And it's not you. I mean, you're, you're, you're alter ego. Uh, do you get mad or do you say, what's that to me? I think, I think the notion of not allowing yourself to be annoyed by asking, what's that to me, is a pretty good recipe for happiness. It doesn't mean you don't help people. No. But, yeah. I, I re do need to bear, can you bear with me on that? Because, uh, okay. Uh, I, I just want to finish the idea of the eternal return. It, it just, it just another half minute. So, so what is the right interpretation of the eternal return? That, that things happen, may the, it's not that w they will happen again and again, but very much in line with Genesis where God says it's good, which is another way of saying, may it happen. May it happen again. It's good enough for it to happen again. Will it happen again? I don't know. But it's good enough. It's good enough for it to happen again. All right? So, so the important thing is to keep in mind that this is not a cosmic view of how many times things happen. This is a moral view of what's good and what isn't good. Wor what's worthy of happening again? Some things are not worthy of happening again, right? And those are the ones we don't want, you know, don't want to be associated with. All right, Charlie, it's yours. Uh, what, what do philosophers generally think about those folks who follow us into eternity? Uh, they will be here, and uh, we, we we affect their lives in many ways. Do, do philosophers take this subject up? Or? Uh, the question is, do philosophers think about what happens to people who come after us? Uh, this comes under the general category, and my lord, there's a literature on it, the general category of uh, uh, 
what obligations do we owe to future generations? And there's, as I say, there's a huge literature on this, and uh, uh, the literature ranges, as all literatures, from the meaningful and interesting and important to the inane. Uh, uh, anybody who says that somehow we are not entitled to anything, that means any of the resources of the earth, because our children and grandchildren need them, is clearly out somewhere uh, in left field. Um, that's just, you know, that's not, that's not meaningful because we do need those resources also. That we shouldn't waste them, of course. But we do need resources, and if we don't have resources, then we're dead. So, um, so th then the question is, how far into the future do you look? Right? But your obligations have to be limited by your foresight. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen. And if we don't know what, what's going to happen, then we're not in a position to say we shouldn't do this or shouldn't do that on the basis of what might or what will happen in 49 generations. So you have to be balanced and sensible. Right, right. Um, the idea, here, the question is, uh, or the comment is, uh, uh, Christ is uh, supposed to have died for us, and uh, we are now many, many, many generations later. Yeah. Uh, I think in just that way, we can follow his example, the great tradition in Christianity of the imitation of Christ, that we, we, we die uh, and leave something of value to the world and to our children and to those, of those who will follow us. And that's a good thing to do. Now the question becomes, what do we, what do we leave? And, uh, and, and, and there's only a general answer to that. You, you leave the very best that you can. Right? You, he, left, he left us the exemplar of self-sacrifice. Um, we can leave the exemplar of self-sacrifice or something else. Something that, uh, that is valuable, something that is not easy. Things that are easy are typically not worth a lot. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the question is, what are the strong to do uh, when they're confronted with cruelty and nastiness on the part of the weak? All right? uh, the, the weak might cause suffering in others and so on. All right. Now, Nietzsche is not against suffering. He's not a pleasure seeker. Uh, he suffered a great deal himself. He excruciating headaches. And the last 12 years of his life, he, he went insane. It was an insane asylum. Uh, don't draw any conclusions as to the value of his philosophy from the fact of where he landed. Uh, I think that you've got to begin by saying, what is it to me? Now, if there's merely pain or suffering created by one person in another, that's probably their business as to how to deal with that. But if there is suffering and pain created in someone who is genuinely helpless, as for instance a child, then the strong have to step in, right? But strength does not mean, please keep in mind, strength does not mean uh, better breeding, higher social position, more money, being of the right race, being of the right religion. None of that is a matter of being strong. But the internal quality of the person. And the internal quality of the person is such that you can't let someone innocent suffer. And then you step in and get yourself in big trouble sometimes. But it's okay. You know, the, the idea that you are active and you get in there and you do things. You know, I do the best you can. Give the best account of yourself. But no whining. I mean, Nietzsche's philosophy is very simple, no whining, right? which we love to do. <laughs> yes, sir? I have a question that uh, correlates with 
Uh, how does Nietzsche correlate with Nazism? Well, number one, Hitler never read Nietzsche, and if he had read Nietzsche, couldn't understand a damn word of it. Uh, but there are elements in Nietzsche uh, that can be properly misinterpreted or improperly misinterpreted, uh, which will then turn him to look like a, uh, uh, a Nazi. Let me give you some examples. Uh, one example is he talks about the blonde, blue-eyed beast. Okay, now that sounds like, uh, you know, like hi what Hitler wasn't. He was a beast, but not blonde and blue-eyed, right? Uh, he talks about that. But he also, he, he also talks about strongly against Germans uh, and, and against uh, religious and racial prejudice. He talks strongly against that. There's a book uh, uh, by uh, a fellow by the name of Kaufman, who was a professor at, uh, at uh, Princeton. And Kaufman demonstrated, translated Nietzsche, and demonstrated that when uh, Nazi writers quote Nietzsche, they quote him selectively without indicating the selectivity of it. Namely, uh, dot, 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 dot. So he says something, and then the word not occurs, occurs, and then goes on. All the Nazis did was to take out the word not. Now when you take out the word not, you change 180 degrees, you change the meaning of the sentence, right? And a decent person in quoting would always, as I, I teach my students this, if you quote something and you leave out something, you say dot, dot, dot. Well, the Nazis didn't. They just conflated it. So in other words, I think it's a bum rap. Uh, Nietzsche was not in any sense a Nazi. He was not a German nationalist even. He thinks the French are much better. Uh, he, uh, when he talks about strength, he does not mean uh, machine guns and big muscles. He means in individual, independent strength of character. So that doesn't sound to me like uh, Hitler or any Nazi. Yes? How, how does the uh, strong person in Nietzsche relate to the Huberman? All right. Now, now there is a notion in Nietzsche that is, um, th thank you for, uh, uh, for raising that issue. The question is, how does the strong relate to what uh, Nietzsche calls as the overman or the superman, the Ubermensch? Careful. Uh, Übermensch literally means a human being above the human race, not somebody who is uh, uh, you know, utterly different from us, has two heads and a big brain, uh, not like that, uh, 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 but somebody who manifests the very best of human character and human qualities. That's the overman or, the, or, or that, that human being who is above the ordinary. Right. Now, uh, does he think that there's a race of such people that uh, they're coming? No, not at all. But he thinks is that this is something that we could maybe aim at for ourselves. If we could reach the stage of being so strong that it would totally bust the, the, the ordinary, totally go beyond the ordinary, I think that's what it means to be above the human. Right? Superhuman, if you like. Well, you know, some people are superhuman in being able to stand pain. Some people are superhuman because they are unaffected by the nasty things that go on around them. Some people are superhuman by seeing the magnificence of the world 24-7. I don't know when they get sleep, but they're, even in their sleep, they're smiling. Uh, that's, you know, so that's the kind of superhuman that he's talking about. Okay? Yes, sir. No. Does, do the strong have an ability, uh, sorry, uh, an obligation? Do the strong have an obligation to help the weak? No. Uh, Nietzsche does not like the idea of obligation. Obligation is when one person grabs hold of another and says, you've got to do that. In other words, it's the next thing to making you do it. Right? It's a nice way of making you do it. And Nietzsche doesn't like that idea because it violates self-reliance and self-motivation. Now, that you would do it is one thing, right? It's a good thing to do it. You would do it. But that you ought to do it, 
that you're obliged to do it, no. There's a lot of things that we're not obliged to do that are good things to do, and we do them. Right? You're, you're not strictly speaking obliged to love your wife. You, you must honor her. You, might, you, know, you may not love her, but it's good if you do. Gets you, a lot of, gets you into, out of a lot of trouble, too. <laughs> all right. So, so, so what does it all amount to? Let's see, how much time do I have? A few minutes. What does it all amount to? You know, uh, uh, life is a difficult journey. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't want you to take that away as the meaning of this lecture. Um, li life is a very difficult journey. Uh, it, it involves a lot of pain. It involves a lot of things that we would prefer not to have to undergo. It involves an incredible amount of self-searching and failure. Right? So Nietzsche isn't talking about here is the way in which you can live your life happily ever after. He's not talking about that. Anybody who talks about that hasn't lived. There are no prescriptions for how to live a happy life. There are no prescriptions for that. But what there is, 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 a, is a set of guidelines for how it's possible to cope with the difficulties that we see in the world. And the best guidelines that I've seen are the guidelines that Nietzsche, Nietzsche has. Namely, be strong. Uh, be able to overlook all kinds of imperfections, things that we think are imperfections in the world. If you can overlook that, if you can just allow people to be the way they want to be and go on your way and attend to your own soul, I mean, this is the deepest, deepest message of, of good religion. Attend to your soul. Make yourself at peace with the world. Make yourself at peace with yourself. That's vintage Nietzsche. He couldn't do it. That's why he ended up in a madhouse. He couldn't do it. He, was, he lived too intensely. So one of the things, it seems to me, that we must do is to live not so intensely. I mean, it's wonderful to be able to see the sky and, and to rejoice in the flight of the birds and so on. But, but don't get to the stage, Nietzsche says. Don't get to the stage that I did, uh, where all of this intensity carries me to the madhouse. Uh, balance. He does talk about balance. He does talk about that. And I think that balance, if you can achieve it and, 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 and if you manage that balance as a balance of your soul, not only your external behavior, if you manage to do that, you will live well. Will you survive death? Nietzsche says, not a chance. Not a chance. But you know what? A friend of mine said, uh, uh, you, you only live once. Uh, but if you play your cards right, that should be enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>